good afternoon all. Let's then resume our work. We will not wait too long uh, as we are already six minutes late from the planned agenda. First, before start, actually I got a kind of a minus from a previous session as a moderator. I did not present myself and then I did present everybody in the panel but not myself. And in that sense, I want to correct this now. Uh, I'm, my name is Dan Keserevich. I'm new head of the governing bodies within the IOM. I have some 20 plus years of working experience within uh, uh, the immigration field. I started my life as a refugee lawyer and then moved uh, towards migration. I work for all fields that are actually present here. I was the first academic, then moved uh, uh, my work and work uh, for one American NGO. From there, I moved and worked for a Swiss uh, Development Corporation, that is, Swiss government organization, and from there I was a deputy minister in my own government, and then joined IOM, meaning I made a full circle around. That's me in brief, uh, and I will not, I will stop. In IOM I work uh, in Ukraine, Belarus, Central Asia. I came here as a basically sub-regional according chief of mission in uh, five Central Asian countries before I served there for uh, seven years. Uh, now uh, we're coming to the next uh, session, it's actually called Migrant Force. Uh, and it's actually, I will could say, it's a voice uh, that we need to listen. Uh, here we have uh, two uh, distinct uh, uh, panelists. Uh, on, from my right is Ms. Uh, Tana Fa Farok, I pronounced properly. Yeah. Uh, uh, Tana is a Yemeni documentary photographer and storyteller based in Netherlands. In 2016, she was awarded uh, uh, Break the Silence Scholarship to pursue master in academy in the documentary photography and photojournalism at University of Westminster in London. Her work aims to achieve personal reportage that negotiates themes of memory, boundaries, and violence. Uh, she focuses on collaborative storytelling tell projects to tell personal anecdotes as displacement and migration. Previously, Tana worked uh, with various international NGOs in Yemen to tell stories of displacement uh, women and children, portraying the suffering and highlighting the uh, forgotten crisis there. Her work uh, appeared in several publications among them, Al Jazeera, World Press Photo, BBC, uh, Huffington Post, CNN, and others. Recently, Tana was awarded the Open Society Foundation Fellowship Grant and exhibition of her ongoing project, The Passport. All correct? Uh, and I would like to present also the other uh, colleague as actually this should be your, your, your show. I will just present you then just give you the floor. Uh, Mr. On my uh, left is Mr. Uh, Khalid Kari. Khalid Kari is an entrepreneur who founded the Homestown Cooperative, correct? Right. Homestown was set up in Rome to, in 2017 and to provide the local communities with authentic Syrian cuisine. The business has helped migrant employees of of all of whom are Syrian refugees, become financially independent and integrate into the Italian society. It also builds a partnership with Italian business and social organizations. I'm actually very happy that I have a two uh, youth that will speak about it, and then I will just uh, start it and give you the floor. Uh, in order that I actually present you, then Tana, floor is yours. Thank you so much for your warm uh, introduction. So um, I'd like to start um, my talk today with this phrase here, who knows I might survive. I, this, as a storyteller, um, this phrase comes in every conversation I have with the people I photograph. It comes from, I heard it from the women in Yemen who try to do their best to make it work in spite of all the challenges. I heard it from um, the refugees, the Yemeni refugees around the borders between Djibouti and Yemen. I heard it from Khaled, uh, a guy who's been living in, the, in a refugee camp forever now with no legal status or paper. And basically, I heard it from everyone who's going through this weird phase of integration, um, learning a new language, uh, trying to fit in, um, um, working hard to actually please the society. 
And I love this phrase so much, to be honest. I think it carries this notion of uncertainty, but also hope. I love it more because I lived it myself, I experienced it, I went through it. And sometimes when I reflect about my story, to be honest, I don't know where it began. Um, every story has a beginning, middle, and end. I don't care that much to know the end, but I'm very curious where did it start with me. Because I record moments as a photographer, I think my moment started here, in Yemen. This is a picture of, um, this is me and my husband here. This is where we were, sleep, uh, we were sleeping, just between the bathroom and the kitchen, because it's the only corner in the house that doesn't have windows. This is where we felt protected from the shattered window glass. Soon, uh, sooner enough, we left Yemen temporary, but we do feel sometimes that we're still living in the temporary. What happens afterward is that what it was me trying to visualize the trauma I've been through. It was my journey to trace it. What is trauma? Is trauma invisible? How can I trace it? How can I visualize it? For me, trauma is like this, like this drawing here. I really don't know how to understand it. But sometimes I feel, as a storyteller, I create, I produce work because I want to connect. I want to cross barriers. You see, when, when I feel so uncomfortable, when things are so strange to me, but when I put them in a story, they don't feel strange anymore, and I feel so relieved. A way for me to do that is through participatory photo projects. I feel so privileged that I have means of expression, that I own the medium. Photography is so powerful that I am an, I am an author of my own story and um, I'm an insider to other people's stories. So for my participants, for the people I photograph, I wanted this for them as well. I want them to have this sense of agency. So in every photo project, I make sure that my participants have this, you know, we have this exchange of thoughts and ideas, and they are willing and capable to express themselves the way I do. I work with children, I work with everyone. This is my latest series from uh, Markazi Cam. I think it's the only camp for Yemenis in Djibouti. And the way I, you know, when you are in a move, Nobody asks you, oh, how are you feeling? Uh, or how are you? You're like constantly trying to survive. And I think for these children, I really wanted to ask them, how are you feeling? What are your hopes and dreams? And through their writings, they express that. So I'm gonna translate to you what they are saying here. This is Yasmin. She said, I don't like housework. This is Bushra, she's saying to me, one day my dream will come true. This is Saeed saying to me, um, I wanna be a soldier. This is Khaled saying to me, I hate swearing and saying bad words. He's a good kid. This is Mohsen, he's saying to me, I really wanna be free from the prison of racism. This is Sarah, she wants to be a lawyer. This is Amina, she says to me, nobody forgets his country. This is Khaldun saying to me, I really wanna live a life like other children in the world. And this is Ahmed, my closest, I think. Um, he says, I've been looking for my own mom for days and the only reason for him to say that because he's lo he lost his mom uh, during, for three months in Yemen. There was a happy ending, they found each other. And this is Sarah saying to me, um, Taiz Bilad al Ais. Taiz is a city in Sana'a that was mostly the bom bombarded. And this is Saba saying to me, I hate to be homesick. So through this series, 
I wanted to exchange these feelings with children. I want them to be able to express their hopes and dreams, and I want to carry their voice over and over again. On a bigger scale, I work on a, sorry. I work on a photo book project called The Passport. And basically, The Passport is also a participatory photo project where I get to tell stories of migrants, displaced people, refugees, through the notion of documents. Um, what does it mean for you to be a Yemeni carrying the Yemeni passport? What does it mean for you to be a Syrian carrying the Syrian passport? Basically, how can such a piece of document, literally this size or maybe smaller, control us, define us, shape us? So the project also was done through the portraiture and um, uh, letters. Uh, I'm showing you examples here. I hope you can read it. <laughs> so yeah, uh, it seems that I figured it out. It seems that I have now my means of expression that I can connect and in a way I am navigating through the barriers. Um, it seems that I survived, but yes, I managed, I survived, I did it. But let me walk you through behind the scenes. So, um, at this phase, I think my identity became so complex. In a way, I have this one identity that is based on similarity and unity and my internal factors, my culture, my backgrounds, but at the same time, my identity became so active in the process of identification with new culture, new place. Now, I don't have problem with that. I am willing to embrace it. It's such a nice thing. I have this huge perspective on life. Um, the only thing that bothers me is that I and so many people I got to photograph, we're confronting labels that we never ever been exposed to before. Labels such as uh, refugee, asylum seeker, stateless, undocumented. And to be honest, it's such an, a shame because these labels put us in a lock and in a closet. We are so in the shadow and it's such a, it's, I'm saying it's, a, it's such a shame because what do you, how do you expect to unlock our potential if we're in the shadow? This is something I wish for. I wish we come up with initiatives, with you know, social, culture, artistic initiatives that would work so hard to, to promote, I don't know, like social um, you know, um, inclusion pro projects projects that will work hard to, to melt the barriers. We need to be fully engaged. The Lowly Road, this is not a name of a project, but I, before I tell you what is that, I wanna ask you, but be honest with me. In a show of hands, how many of you have started their life again from zero after going so far in their careers and their whatever they're doing? Be, please be honest. Okay, I see lots of hands in the back. I am one of them. So yes, uh, The Lonely Road is, we're starting our life from zero. When you're in a move, there's, it's not a bad thing to start your life from a zero. But when you are alone, it's a very dark road. You have no idea. I wish also for efforts that we spend so much of our time and energy to to bring those people who are got stuck in this phase and to actually guide them through this road. We are only so obsessed with you know, highlighting the successful examples. But what about those who got stuck in this phase? This leads me to a really quote I like by Margaret Edward, a Canadian poet, who says, when you are in the middle of a story, it's not a story at all but only a confusion, a dark, roaring, a blindness. It's only afterwards that it becomes anything like a story, when you're telling it to yourself or someone else. I think I am in the middle of a story still. And I'll tell you something, um, we're always gonna be on a move, we're always gonna be moving, we're gonna leave our countries, we're gonna return to our countries, but I think 
if that must happen, then let's move barriers and walls in a state. We, I don't know, I'm not going to, you know, um, s label us again, but we young people, um, we have these two journeys in this moving process, one that leads to hope and the other leads to despair. And it's actually up to you, up to me, up to all of us to guide us, to guide everyone through the right phase. Thank you. me and inviting me to be ah did you hear me no right okay here we are so <laughs> thank you so much for having me and uh, I'm really super happy to be with you today guys so my name is Khaled I'm gonna go to talk about like my travel and how I arrived here and uh, how I'm sitting right now with you so Syria when I said the country Syria, what comes, what comes to your mind? When I say a country Syria, what comes to your mind? Yes, Syria has been reduced to war. People are suffering every single moment. Actually, even this moment while we sit and talk about them. But I'm not here to dwell about the present the past, or even to talk about the present. I'm here to talk about the future of my country, the future that seems far off. And certain, but most definitely inevitable, the future will be there for Syria. Eventually, the war will stop. And that's why I'm here to talk about present that leads to the future and is not hent by the past. I decided to leave my country in 2015 after uh, working as a soldier for five years, and uh, I decided to skip the country because the place wasn't like so safe, and uh, I arrived to the decision that I don't want to kill anyone, and I don't want to let anyone to kill me, so I have to go out with my buddy. I arrived to Turkey, I skipped like as all the immigrants. I, I searched for people to smuggling me through Syria to Turkey. I lived in, in Turkey like for a year between stations, airports, searching for a life and stuff. After that, I traveled to Libya to cross the sea coming to Europe. <clears throat> when I arrived to Europe, also like it's long story, hold the journey because I crossed over the sea and was like five days and one of, of the organization treat really bad refugees, immigrants in the middle of the sea because I would love to, to tell you the small experience in the middle of the huge boat. We were super hungry for three, for three days. We don't have any water, any food. And one of the people who worked with the organization, I'm not gonna go to call it, he had an apple in his hand and we were more than 500 people in the boat. And he grabbed this apple and throw it in the fly and we create like a mountain of human being. We came off of like all of us like up each other. So the place was bloody. So I arrived to Lampedusa. The place can hold only 200, 300 people for a time of 20 and 27 hours. I arrived when a thousand others were already there. No resource, no food, no first aid, no advising, no translation. Forget mental health. When it comes to not even getting the basic necessity of life, after five days, I decided to leave. I'm, gonna go to, I'm going to leave. I cannot leave in this, in this way. I skipped work. I skipped work because I'm not feeling safety. I skipped work because I want to continue my education. I skipped work because I want to live safe as any human being. He has to, be, he has to live safe. He has to have his right. He has to do what he has to do in life. I skipped to Switzerland. But I had also another, <laughs> I arrived to Italy, so I skipped to Switzerland. We're gonna go to find why I skipped to Switzerland. During my time, I've been, I have, I've been treated like prisoner, and worse, as an animal at the time. 
have been treated as treat, has been treated a threat on the nation and been handcuffed and taken place. Unlucky, my family, unlucky, unlike my family, I was giving food three times a day, yes, but at the same time, I wasn't able to connect them for three months at the time. Yes, I was breathing, but beauty alive. I was angry, frustrated, disappointed, hurt, and hopeless. I, hadn't, I had no, no, no directions. I would land in the airport or train station and not know where to go next, where to live, where to eat, where to go, and yet I'm here. Standing in front of you as entrepreneur, speaking in English, studying in Rome, giving a speech here in Geneva, in front of you, capable be people. I would like to talk about how I integrate with the Italian society since I arrived. When I arrived to Rome, there was no accommodation for me. I spent three months in the street, living in the sidewalk. I get, in, I get to know an organization which is called Pop Up Experience. This organization, they take care about immigrants, about refugees who live in the street, who don't have any document. They give him uh, medical, uh, health, like um, health, health care. They give health care, access to education, access to, 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 to the law, like figure out how they can get like break, break up the, the, their paper. After this time, from getting help to helping people as volunteer. So I try my situation from someone who living the street with this organization to start to be volunteering. After that, I start to create, I was a one of the founder of a company which is called Homos Town, which is really wonderful company, which helps Syrian refugee to be self-confident, independent, to have their own money, which we cook, we package, we catering. We do cooking, packaging, catering. We hire refugees. They start to integrate with learning languages and, and, and integrate with the society. Right now, I'm going to create my own business, which also hummus, <laughs> because I love hummus. I'm going to, <laughs> I'm going to uh, create my, my own company, which is called also Hummus Roma. But with this company, I'm gonna go to show the cultural of Arab, to have like a small library where we can go all together to, I know exactly that refugees has to integrate with the native people, but also I believe that the native people, we have to meet in halfway. We have to meet in halfway. I believe that native people also, they have to like learn some, something about our culture, uh, going on, do this kind of mixing. So the idea of Homos Roma, so we're gonna go to have a place which is library when we can meet halfway, when we can introduce our culture, when we can uh, give the local people this opportunity to know how we are. So finally, I want, I have like small of recommendation and I have like really special case about uh, the organization whose work in Rome. There is an old man, he has 35, uh, 50, 53, years old and he tried to bring his family to Italy and even after having accepting for the government of Italy to bring his family to Italy, to Italy, his contract with camp when he leaves is done, is finished. So the camp telling him you have to go out this camp and he went to the camp telling him, hey guys, I just ask you a permission to bring my family here and they said, okay, we can bring your family but your family, would, they will live in the camp but you cannot see them there is no sense to bring them from Syria. Like leave them in Syria and don't bring them to Syria next to their father and their father they cannot visit them because he has to be in the street. According to Italian law, each refugee has to stay with the government just six months and this, and this six months he has to be enrolled and integrate and have language and figuring out work. Italian people they cannot figure work for themselves sometimes. 
Italian young people, how you accept an immigrant, Ruvigi, his arrived to new land, new language, new cultural, everything is new, everything around him is strange, totally. He wants even to understand, to get integrated, to know what's going on, and after that, he can start working, after that he can, he can start learning the language. If he's not comfortable with his mental health, let's see, thinking about his family living under the war, and this, and this, and this, and this, etc., 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 etc. So, but this is uh, the law, like uh, the, the how, how organization is working around, how they treat immigrants, how the law is not like matching what, what the need in, in, the real, in the real society, in the real world. There is none like, there is none work, there is none like uh, a program for integrate. There is something, a lot of things is missing. I'm sorry I, sp I talk long, um, and this is who I am. Thank you so much. Thank you both. Uh, after listening to those two, two breathtaking stories, I'm opening the floor to all of you for any questions, comments, suggestions, please. Yeah. I cannot see Yemen. Please, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. And I wish to thank uh, Thana and Khaled for sharing their stories. Uh, which I do feel that uh, it's heartbreaking. And uh, I wish to thank Tana for highlighting an important issue about the uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, which we face either in Syria or uh, in Yemen, uh, where the uh, highly affected people are the uh, children, youth, and women, where the, uh, they have a limited access to the psychological support, either in the hospitals or in specialized uh, centers. And, uh, uh, I join the voice uh, both uh, Khaled and Thana for the supporting the youth-based initiatives, which is highly uh, important. Uh, but I have a, a question uh, for both. Uh, what is missing over here that uh, we cannot hear more stories and more voices uh, of the uh, most affected uh, youth uh, especially uh, those uh, under the conflict uh, areas. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Do we have another question that we can, or we can respond to this one and then wait for another one? Okay, then let's go for response. And please. You know, sometimes, uh, thank you so much for your question. And, um, you know, I sometimes call myself um, a visual researcher. Uh, it's a, a research question that I'm going through now. What is missing? Um, I think what is missing is the voice of the people themselves. Uh, I highlighted or I mentioned that I, you brought, um, we're always obsessed with bringing successful examples, but we somehow neglect the unsuccessful examples. Um, we cheer up for those who made it, because it makes us feel good, and we forgot those who did not make it. I wish somebody from the panelists today who did not make it, but this is what is missing. Um, I share for Khaled, he's such a successful example, started his business, you know, went to university again, I had this conversation with him from nothing to everything, and, but what, we, what is missing is the things that we don't hear about, those people who are still around the borders, those people who could not start a new life because they are still in square in, in zero, in, 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 you know, at this zero phase. Um, we, when I was in Yemen, people, you know, I get this request, we need to hear about women resilience and everything, can you tell us more? But yeah, women made it. But can you, do you wanna hear about those women who did not made it, make it? So I think, I'm not trying to be pessimistic here. I know we need to hope, but also we need stories of um, the other version of not hope. I think this is what's missing because only then we can act more. Uh, I hope I answered your question. Thank you so much. I have like just a small thing to say. Uh, exactly what is missing that 
a lot of when when you find like a new story or when you find like someone who wants really to express himself and like start to talking what's going on, what's happening, what's happening for women in the border, for children in the border. People use their story in bad way. Which I mean. I mean if I meet like a journalist, he gonna go to advertise a lot of thing over my, my shoulder and then I'm gonna go to feel bad because I told him what's going on. So a huge percentage of refugees, they have like huge stories. They can change a lot of things and by just telling story, they feel scared. They feel that another people are advertising over them. They, they stop talking just. If you go to them and ask them, what's going on? Can you tell me what's going on in your country? Can you, can you tell me what's going on in the border? Can you tell me what's going on in there? Here, he will not never tell you because he lose this kind of trust. He, like, he didn't trust this community anymore. He's feeling scared even to, like, to express himself, what he has to say. If he said, he gonna go to find this story to, tomorrow, is publish it, the journalists get money, the organizing of establish get money, they get money, and he is who tell the story, he living in the sidewalk still. This is missing. Thank you so much, I hope this is if I answered. Thank you both. Uh, is there any other question or reflection? I cannot really see. Please present yourself. My name is Elaine Franz from Flow in Action. Um, and uh, I had the great pleasure of working with Khaled um, in the last 12 months. Um, so I'm very honored and delighted that he is on the panel. We heard it this morning and we've heard it again in this session that there are commonalities of humanity in, in the stories, there's an intersectionality across stories that unite us and unite everyone in this room. So I'd be really interested to hear from, from the panel from what, um, if you could give us three elements, three emotions, three um, aspects of those stories that unite everyone in this room and act as a call to action, a call to the humanity in each one of us in this room, what would it be? What would those three things be? Okay, yeah. just give, it, give me some time to think, <laughs> then it'll, just a se couple of seconds. And I would add everyone who's checking their mobile phone at this minute, if they could perhaps put those down and pay attention to these stories. So uh, I hope that uh, if I get the meaning of the question, which means that um, I have to name three kind of emotion, why uh, refugees or, or immigrants, they didn't tell their story or what the impact from this room right now after telling our story, our what what I'm expecting, like for example. Honestly, I'm expecting future. Um, I don't want like the thing, the suffering or the experience. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna go to call it experience because I had this word suffering. So experience, the, the experience that I, I, I went through it through traveling and crossing the sea and living in the street and like losing, like you feel yourself lose. I don't like to, to give it to anyone. And uh, I hope like after this, like this talk, we have it to figure out like even small stories. But the, mist, the, the most three important emotions when you leave your country or when you are like working with refugees, like as Khaled, I really feel scared. I really feel scared. Um, I really feel, feel scared for the future because I cannot give a real name for the future. I cannot see like 2050, for example, 2050. I, I cannot imagine, I don't have like real imagine. Uh, the, according to science, there is no, not, no, no, no real image for 2050, for example. 
according to climate change, according to environment, according to policy, according to the war is going on in the Middle East, according to England, according, uh, according to, to Latin America, according to everyone, according to the United States, according to the crazy is going on in the world. Uh, uh, I don't know, there is like really so hard, but I hope, like I have really hope, like with full meaning of hope, that we can, we can do something. Like all we need is a table, like circle table, five, cha like five chairs and talk about something and we go to do it honestly and with all, all, like, it's not business. Like when you are working, like humanity, you want to fix the world. If, like, in all the cases, in all the chair, like if, if you are talking about women or if we are talking about, about, uh, uh, about children, or if we are talking about immigrant environment, uh, beauty, this, if we can, like without business, we don't want to make benefit about this, from this problem. We have to fix it and go over it. And right now, like, I, I don't know, I don't know. And all the, that's it, that's it, that's it. We, got, we have to go over it. I'm sorry, like, because I'm, I'm a little bit emotional. So uh, this is my, my answer. I have this, I hope if uh, I get your question. Okay, so I'm gonna name three things that I think unite us in this room and will motivate us for actions. I, um, these are passion, curiosity, and empathy. Whereas all of us are so passionate about doing something good. We don't know it yet or how to you know, implement it, but we, we have this passion. Otherwise, why are you in this room, right? The other thing, curiosity. We are so curious about other human stories. So how about we can, you know, um, enforce this curiosity in, in raising our passion to, to, to actually change human lives. And when I, when I say change human lives, I'm not talking here about the basics, helping them learn a new language, fit in the system, cross the borders. I'm talking about help them construct a new way of life that suits us all, that can, you know, act, that can make us feel that we are fully engaged here. Uh, the third thing is empathy. I think we all have this, uh, but we, we, we keep saying these words and we, we believe in them, but I think we, if we implement it in real life, practically, in people's life, and we exercise it in actions, then I think we'll see so much good coming. Um, Another thing, it's not one of the things, but uh, last week in The Hague, I think a few weeks ago in The Hague, uh, there was those, you know, protests against uh, climate change and everything. And if you ask me, did you go? I really wanted to participate. But I feel like my head is so occupied with a lot of things to do. And like my family in Yemen, how are they doing? Me dealing with the integration in the Netherlands. I really want to be engaged, I think. Um, but I can't do that because I am occupied with all these problematic things that is happening to me, uh, facing this new phase in, uh, in life. So I think if we focus our energy and effort in these th three things, I, I see so much good coming. So much uh, things are coming on the ground. I hope I answered your question. Sorry, I'm nervous in the panel. <laughs> Thank you. Do we have another question or intervention from the, from the floor? then uh, we should thank you to our both uh, uh, wonderful uh, speakers that we had today for our migrant voice uh, panel and and uh, I think as actually if the migration is, is uh, def defined as a process in the time and space I think the things that we need to think also about like how we'll actually bring the youth as some of the time just coming to the current space of those of dialogue that we have in this uh, room uh, uh, thank you all, and please don't leave, because now we will just exchange uh, the panelists. Instead of one Dayan getting another one also named Dayan, who will uh, moderate the next session, and then let's uh, proceed. Thank you. Thank you.